Well, uh, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, pleasure to have everybody here this afternoon. Can you hear me okay on this microphone? Good. Uh, it's our pleasure to, to be here today in Palm Beach with uh, friends and associates of the University of Maryland Medical Center, <clears throat> excuse me, and the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, this is our first effort to uh, reach out uh, during the winter months to our friends, volunteers, and uh, close associates here in Florida. Um, so this is a first. I can assure you we've had a wonderful weekend here in Palm <coughs> Beach. Uh, thanks to many of you who've been our hosts, uh, and we certainly plan to do this in future years. So at the end of our session today, we're, we're going to ask you for a little feedback about how we can continue to do this in future years, improve it, and uh, make sure that we have a program that uh, really captures your interest and is helpful to you. Um, uh, I am Jeff Rivest. I'm president and CEO of the University of Maryland Medical Center. Um, I think most of you know where the University of Maryland Medical Center is located. Just in case you don't, though, I can tell you an easy way to find it. It is three blocks from M&T Stadium, <laughs> the home of the world champion Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> We're that easy to find, that easy to find. Um, we are um, uh, privileged really to be uh, close partners and associates with the University of Maryland School of Medicine. All the members of our full-time medical staff are faculty members at the School of Medicine, um, and we're going to introduce you to some of our distinguished faculty members in just a few moments, and I know you'll enjoy hearing from them about their research, uh, their clinical care, and advances that are occurring <coughs> in their specialties. Um, I also want to note that we are privileged to be a part of a larger health system in the state of Maryland called the University of Maryland Medical System. Um, it reaches just about every part of the state of Maryland. We have 12 hospitals now. We're growing very rapidly. President and CEO of the University of Maryland Medical System is Mr. Bob Krenzik. I want to recognize Bob right here in the front row. Bob, welcome. <laughs> Chairman of our board of the University of Maryland Medical System is Mr. Steve Birch. Right here, Steve, please say hello. Glad to have you here. Um, we're also privileged as part of our organization to have three additional boards that really are advocacy and philanthropy boards for us. Uh, and they help us really focus on three of our major programs. And I want to just briefly recognize three people who chair those boards. The board of our children's hospital is chaired by Ms. Jen Stearman. Jen, in the back row there, please say hello. Thank you for joining us here. Um, the board of our shock trauma center is uh, chaired by a well-known person you all know, Senator Frank Kelly, here with his wife, Janet. Uh, and of course, the board of our cancer center is chaired by our great friend, uh, long-term colleague, Stuart Weitzman. Stuart, you're there. Thank you. And Stuart, thank you and Lynn for your host this weekend. It's great, great to uh, have you do that. Um, real briefly also, we have a few of our hospital CEOs with us here today, and I'm looking quick to make sure I don't miss anybody. A few of the hospitals in the University of Maryland medical system who do a lot to serve the state um, are represented here today. Um, Mr. Lyle Shelton, President and CEO of the Upper Chesapeake Health System in Hartford County. Um, Mr. Ken Kozell, President and CEO of Shore Health. Um, and also, I think she stepped out, um, Karen Olskamp is President and CEO of Baltimore Washington Medical Center, right near Glen Burnie and Anne Arundel County. If you haven't met Karen, we'll introduce you when she's here. Okay, with that, it's my pleasure. I, I did, Karen's not here at the moment, right? I didn't miss her, right? Okay, all right, okay. Um, so it's my pleasure now to go ahead and get us started in, again, our first ever University of Maryland Health Matters. Uh, and it's my privilege to introduce to you um, a very distinguished physician leader in the state of Maryland, our friend and colleague, the dean of our University of Maryland School of Medicine, Dean E. Albert Reese. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Dr. Reese's background. Uh, I have a three-page bio on Dr. Reese, and you're going to get the one-third page version. Um, he has a very distinguished career, and we're certainly very fortunate that he joined us at the University of Maryland as dean about six years ago. Uh, Dr. Reese serves as the University of Maryland's Vice President for Medical Affairs and the John Z. and Akiko K. Bowers Distinguished Professor and Dean of the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Reese is also a professor in the departments of obstetric and gynecology, medicine, and biochemistry and molecular biology. He is a member of the prestigious Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and recently started a three-year term on its governing council. Originally from Jamaica, West Indies, Dr. Reese holds a bachelor's degree from Long Island University, a medical degree from the New York University School of Medicine, a PhD in biochemistry from the University of the West Indies, and an MBA from the Fox School of Business and Management of Temple University. 
Now, with all those degrees, you might think that Dr. Reese has spent a, a lot of time in school, and he has, but he did all that while he was advancing his medical career. Dr. Reese completed his internship and residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Columbia University Medical Center, a postdoctoral fellowship in maternal fetal medicine at the Yale University School of Medicine. He remained on full-time faculty at Yale for 10 years after his fellowship, and in November 1990, at the ripe young age of 39, Dr. Reese, do you remember the age of 39? No. Okay. <laughs> He was recruited by Temple University um, School of Medicine in Philadelphia to serve as their Abraham Roth Professor and Chairman of the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences. Uh, after his tenure at Temple, he moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. Between 2001 and 2006, he served as Vice Chancellor of the University of Arkansas Center for Medical Sciences and also Dean of their College of Medicine. And again, as I mentioned earlier, in 2006, we were quite fortunate to have him recruited to the University of Maryland. Uh, and since that time, he's served in his capacity as our Dean of the School of Medicine. The last thing I wanna note before I uh, introduce Dr. Reese to you is under his leadership, the University of Maryland School of Medicine has made quantum leaps in research and clinical education. Um, they are now the sixth ranked public medical school in the entire country in terms of research funding. Uh, very impressive progress made under Dr. Reese's uh, tenure and leadership. And of course, we greatly appreciate that. The success of our School of Medicine is closely and intricately tied to the success of our medical center. Um, and uh, the ability to have that type of prestigious national ranking helps us recruit the best and brightest physicians who you're gonna hear from this afternoon. So it's my pleasure to turn this over to Dr. Reese. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you very much. Uh, let me add my welcome to that of uh, Jeff Rivest. Uh, to all of you who are here this afternoon, uh, we, we hope to have an exciting time. It, it'll be, uh, it'll, it'll, we'll have a structured component, but we want to have an interactive component where people can feel relaxed and ask questions and uh, make it a real educational session, but also one that we can in, enjoy. I just want to reemphasize a few points that uh, Jeff made regarding uh, individuals because to me it's so important that uh, Several folks have been involved in, in, in bringing this, this event together, for which we're also grateful. And uh, Stuart Weissman, I want to thank you. He's been, been uh, trying to lure us down to wonderful Florida for, for so many years that we're so happy that you, you've pushed us to make it happen. And again, to my partner and, and healthcare colleague, Bob Krenzik, who with whom I work uh, on a regular basis, I certainly want to acknowledge uh, you. There are two other persons I think I should get some acknowledgement because of their 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 activities, and that is uh, Louise Gonzalez. She serves both on the, on the University of Maryland Board of Regents and also on the University of Maryland Medical System. So we were very happy to have Louise in, in, our, in our midst. <laughs> and I think uh, last is, is my good friend and colleague and mentor, Senator Frank Kelly, who serves both on the University of Maryland Board of Regents as well as the Medical System Board. So, these are, are giants who have really made, as, as Jeff said, uh, a lot of what we do possible by their facilitation, by their support, by their encouragement, and their active involvement. So thank you all for, for all that, that you do. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've assembled a group of international superstars. And I'll tell you more about uh, these uh, incredible individuals in a, in a moment. As uh, Jeff Rivers mentioned earlier, these are all full-time faculty members, senior members, of the School of Medicine, but they're also uh, members of the medical staff of the University of Maryland Medical Center. And let me just introduce these uh, members to you, and then I will tell you a little bit about how we, we will organize this session. Now, they, Jeff played a trick with me. He gave you more of my bio than I really was expecting. I'm, I'm going to give a little bit of the individual, uh, the, these uh, individuals bio also, as Jeff did. So please uh, uh, pardon as I read, read your bio. Dr. Park, to my far left, Dr. Myung Park. She is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology in the School of Medicine. She's also director of the Pulmonary Vascular Disease Program. And at the same time, she serves as the director of inpatient cardiology at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Dr. Park has numerous clinical trials, has led numerous clinical trials in the treatment 
of pulmonary hypertension, as well as heart failure and heart transplantation. She's extensively published in the areas of management and treatment of pulmonary hypertension, cardiac transplant immunology, ventricular assist device, treatment of cardiac rejection, and medical therapies for patients with end-stage congestive heart failure. So that's a brief bio of Dr. Parr. Now, Dr. Stephen Bartlett, so folks know who you are. Dr. Bart Dr. Bartlett is the Peter Angelos Distinguished Professor and Chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He is also the Surgeon-in-Chief and the Senior Vice President at the University of Maryland Medical System. Dr. Bartlett has developed the kidney and pancreas transplant program into one of the largest and most successful programs in the United States. Dr. Bartlett performed Maryland's first simultaneous pancreas kidney transplant, as well as its first successful pancreas alone transplant. Dr. Bartlett is recognized as a leader in the development of single incision laparoscopic minimal invasive surgery. Now Dr. Kevin Cullen. Okay, Dr. Cullen is a professor of uh, medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He is also the director of the University of Maryland Marlene and Stuart Greenbaum Cancer Center. Dr. Cullen is a member of the American Cancer Society National Board of Directors. He also serves on the board of directors of the Association of American Cancer Institutes and most recently was appointed by President Obama as a member of the National Cancer Advisory Board. It is under Dr. Cullen's leadership that the University of Maryland Greenbaum Cancer Center achieved National Cancer Center designation. And this is an NCI, National Cancer Center Cancer Institute designation in 2008. And this is a unique accolade that is uh, afforded to only one of 64, 66 such cancer centers across the country. There are 900 cancer centers, and we're, just, we're uh, one of them, but most importantly, there are only 66 of the 900 that are actually designated by the Cancer Institute. In 2012, the cancer center that Dr. Cullen leads ranked, was ranked by the U.S. News and World Report number 11 out of 900. Dr. Stephen Davis, to my immediate left. Dr. Davis is a Theodore E. Woodward professor and chairman of the Department of Medicine in the School, in the school of Medicine. He's also director of the Clinical and Translational Science Research Center and physician-in-chief at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Dr. Davis is an, is an esteemed endocrinologist. A lead he leads a team of scientists who are performing cutting-edge research on treating adults with diabetes, com diabetes and diabetes complications, as well as other metabolic disorders. In 2012, the U.S. News and World Report ranked diabetes in endocrinology, that program, as the 11th best in the nation. Dr. Davis's laboratory has found areas in the brain that act to blunt the, abilities, the body's ability to pre protect itself from hypoglycemia. And his, and his laboratory has identified promising new treatments and interventions that counteract these mechanisms, stimulating the body's ability to defend itself against hypoglycemia. All four of these individuals, as I said, are international superstars. They're highly published. They're highly sought after. They're incredibly uh, effective in that, which we, in that which we accomplish at the university on a regular basis. So we're very, very happy to, to have them share their, their expertise with you this afternoon. As Jeff Rivas mentioned earlier, the topic of our, of our presentation and discussion this afternoon is going to be Health matters. That's what we want to talk about. The format that I'll use in, in having these, these presentations and, and question and answer periods is going to be a series of leading questions that I will pose. They'll be provocative, attempt to be provocative, <laughs> and, and we, will, we expect them to respond in a succinct manner to really share their expertise and share their, their accomplishments. And we hope that each person will, will be able to do that within a 10-minute time frame. At the end of that series of presentations and question and answer period, I'll open it up to the audience. And it'll be your time. You'll ask questions as you wish. 
they, they, they need not be softballs. They can be hardballs. These are superstars. They can handle it. So we're going to open it up to, uh, to any kind of questions. Before I do that, I'm going to make a few introductory comments. The University of Maryland Medicine, which is really a partnership between the University of Maryland Medical System that my colleague and friend Bob Krenzik leads, and the School of Medicine that I am privileged to lead, is an extraordinary institution. This enterprise between the school and the medical system is Maryland's largest healthcare enterprise, caring for more patients across the state of Maryland than any other institution. It is also America's premier healthcare institution, exemplified by the extraordinary innovations, the research, and the discovery. This is evidenced by our national and international leadership in all the major causes of death in America. They include, number one cause of death, cardiovascular complications. We'll discuss that. Number two cause of death, cancer. We'll discuss that. Number three, which we will not cover this afternoon, stroke. Four and five, diabetes, which we'll cover. Organ transplantation or organ failure, Dr. Bartlett will cover. In each of these areas, we have made significant and major discoveries and advances which are leading the way in America and transforming the way we treat patients and simultaneously impacting the health and well-being of patients across the nation. Finally, let me leave with you just a few facts. As, as Jeff Rivers mentioned, the School of Medicine is, is, an, is, a, is an old institution. It's really one of the premier institutions where medicine began. It's the first public medical school in the United States, over 205 years old, and now is ranking sixth among public medical schools, sixth among the 75 public medical schools, and 16th among the 140 public and private medical schools. The Medical Center, built in 1823, is one of the first academic health centers in the nation, it is the first to have had a residency program in the United States and just one of two hospitals recognized nationwide for its highest quality of patient care. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our distinct pleasure to present to you this afternoon Health Matters. Let me start with some questions that I'll pose first to Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis, diabetes has been, been it's almost becoming a runaway, runaway train. There are about 379, 80 uh, uh, million people worldwide with diabetes. In the United States alone, there are about 30 million people, about half of whom know they have it and half who don't. Most of them are type 2 diabetes. Now, the question that I'd like to pose to you, Dr. Davidson, that is, is, is there any information that you're aware of or research that you have conducted or your colleagues have conducted in which lifestyle changes, when combined with medical intervention, could potentially prevent, halt, or reverse diabetes and its complications. Thank you, Al, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come down for this weekend and participate uh, in this important meeting. Let me take a, a step back and let's define diabetes. Um, is there anyone here that doesn't know someone who has diabetes, either family member, a friend, or even themselves? Hands up you know someone with, with diabetes? Yeah. Do you, you do. You do. <laughs> right. So just about 100%. So as, as Dr. Reese has said, there's close to 30 million people who have diabetes. Um, maybe another 80 million on top of that who are on the cusp of having diabetes. So that's a third of the population of the United States who have diabetes or are going to get diabetes. So what is diabetes? Well, it's a very heterogeneous disorder, um, best described as a relative lack or total lack of this hormone called insulin. Um, we make insulin from our pancreas, pancreas, and then insulin controls our blood glucose. What, it, what insulin does, it unlocks the cell to make energy allow glucose to go in and if you have diabetes you either don't have enough of this insulin or the cell does not respond to insulin 
So there are three common forms of diabetes in the United States. There's the so-called type 1, which typically occurs in children, typically. Um, may or may not be increasing. There's a big squabble going on in the scientific literature to see if that increases. And, and what happens there is that the body mounts an attack on the cells that make insulin and destroys it over a period of time, over about six or seven years. And type 1 diabetes makes up about 5 to 10 percent of this epidemic. The most common is type 2. And then there's a third type that uh, Dean Rees is a world's expert, and that's gestational diabetes. And that typically comes on during pregnancy. It's sort of related to type 2 diabetes, and in most cases, all but 5 percent goes away when the baby is born. But women who have gestational diabetes are at high risk, um, depending on race and ethnicity, of getting type 2 diabetes down the road. Caucasian, 20% risk. African American, Hispanic, up to 60%. But the main problem is this so-called type 2 diabetes. And two things are going wrong there. Uh, the body does not make enough insulin, and the insulin does not work. So remember, nine people out of 10 have got this type 2 diabetes, and it is increasing. Um, type 2 diabetes is, is basically doubling ev every 10 years. So every year in America, 15% of the population will be getting diagnosed with, with diabetes. So what causes this? Well, you're born with the tendency for diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes. If both your parents have type 2 diabetes, you've got a 66% chance of getting it yourself. The juvenile type is, does not tend to run in families. In fact, if the father has type 1 diabetes, there's a tenfold greater risk of the child having type 1 diabetes than the mother. So you might say, well, in that case, if we understand that, why can't we pinpoint individuals who are going to get diabetes? We can, but a very small amount. So there's a few very rare cases where there is just one gene that goes wrong and you get diabetes. But for the common form, this type 2 diabetes, it's many, many genes are involved and it's very, very complicated. So we're born with the tendency to have diabetes. We're born with not enough insulin in these individuals. And then there is a tendency for the insulin not to work. And what makes this get worse and worse over time is obesity. Now, type 2 diabetes is not a lifestyle disease. You don't get type 2 diabetes if you eat too much sugar or sweet things or if you're overweight. What happens is that if you become overweight, that also stops insulin from working and you get the last straw that breaks the camel's back. And it's not all insulin that's, and uh, not all obesity that's, that's bad. So women, for example, carry a lot of subcutaneous fat more than men. That's good. And in fact, that may actually protect against diabetes. What gets you is when you have this central obesity. So for every five and 10 pounds that you put on in your abdomen, that increases the risk. Now, to Dean Reese's point, are there any studies to show that you can prevent diabetes from happening? And there is. Um, there is a, a famous study that was run by the uh, National Institutes of Health. Uh, they got a group of people that are, were at high risk, these pre-diabetics, and they exercised them a lot, um, four times a week. And in another, and they lost about 5% of their body weight. And in another group, they gave one of the common anti-diabetes pills, um, this pill called metformin that you, you may have heard about. And they found that if you, if you exercise regularly and you lost a bit of weight, two-thirds of those individuals did not go on to get diabetes. In fact, that was even better than the people that took this diabetic medication where a third of those individuals didn't get diabetes. But the problem is it takes time. It's a, this is a multidisciplinary approach. 
It's a very complicated disease. And the reason why we have not been successful, either in Maryland or across the country, in translating these research procedures is there's not enough time. There's not enough endocrinologists. There's not enough care providers. And so what we're m now moving towards is multidisciplinary clinics where there is a necessary expertise to translate knowledge into preventing disease. The other half of Dean Reese's question is, okay, if you get diabetes, can you revert? And again, in a small proportion of individuals, we can do that. Um, about 10%, so one out of 10 people with the type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, you've got to have insulin shots to stay alive. But type 2 diabetes, about 1 in 10, can be managed on a diet, can be managed on exercise. But they've got to keep working at it. Because if you don't, if you let that slip, then it, then it comes back. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Uh, Davis. Let me ask another follow-up question on that. Let me just sort of pretend that this question was uh, planted in my ear by some of, the, uh, some of the members in the audience. They want to take something home and, and really make, make, a, make an impact on their colleagues, their friends, their, their family members. They happen to, be, they happen to have, a, I'll give you an example, a, a friend who is overweight or, 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 or obese and has diabetes. And it's just creating a havoc with their lives. They are, they, they, there's glucose all over the place. They're having, maybe even having some... Uh, some consequence of the diabetes. Is there anything that we can, that you have learned from your own research or for your own uh, diabetes practice that you could share that they can have a practical benefit today, tomorrow, from what you will share with them now? Yes, so, so again, thank you for that uh, question. When we think about chronic diseases, we think about, um, first of all, prevention of the disease. So. A cure can be something that normalizes a condition. A cure can be something that is totally preventative. So is there a cure, a vaccine, to stop diabetes? Not at, not at the moment. But we do have treatments that can normalize blood glucose, which in and of itself um, is a cure. But then the question is, well, why aren't we successful? And it's because it's such a complicated condition. And in order to keep one's glucose under control, you've got to think about it all the time. You've got to think about how am I going to make sure that if I eat something, my blood glucose is not going to go too high. So often people have to prick their fingers to get a blood glucose test and find out whether they've eaten too much or too little. One of the uh, projects that we're working on is what's called a continuous glucose monitor, whereby that you can wear a device that can continuously measure your blood glucose, non-invasively, give you recordings every five to 10 seconds, and then that will allow you to judge how much or how little you want to eat, <coughs> how much medicine you need to take, how exercise is, is working. Um, so that, we feel, is, is a major, major breakthrough and will be there before some other um, treatments or advances that will come into play that we may talk about uh, later. So, so let me just ra wrap up uh, as we, we transition. So clearly from what uh, you're, you're sharing with us, and that is with, with your program, the Diabetes and Endocrinologist Center at the University of Maryland Medical Center, you have been able to provide uh, uh, nuances or innovations in treatment that can actually improve the, both the management and the outcome of certain patients who either are at risk for diabetes or maybe themselves have diabetes in how to either mitigate the, uh, the consequences or the complications or to some extent even reverse it. So that I, I think that for the time being we're going to just pause at this point and hold that, that comment unless you want to have a last yeah, the, the compli it's the complications of diabetes that are the real problem. Um, it's $178 billion spent on diabetes in the U.S. each year. 
of which about $120 million are, are the complications. Because just having your blood glucose a little bit high really doesn't matter too much. But what happens if it's not controlled, then it's the leading cause of blindness. It's the leading cause of amputation, amputations, leading cause of kidney disease and uh, end-stage renal failure. It's leading cause of heart attacks and, and strokes. And so, although at the moment we haven't got a vaccine or stem cells that can prevent diabetes, what we can do is that if you get diabetes, we can stop you getting complications. That's called secondary prevention. And what's more, if you get complications, we can stop those getting worse, which is called tertiary prevention. But what we need to do, and we have plans to do this, is a multidisciplinary approach where you will have 12 or 13 different doctors and providers working together in a patient-centered, orientated place will bring the docs to the patients so that we can, in fact, do this while we're waiting for the definitive cure for diabetes to occur. Dr. David, thank you very much for, again, a very, very comprehensive uh, review of uh, the, the programs that you have within your, within your center. Well, I think you've set up the, 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 next, uh, the next question, and that is diabetes becomes the basis for, for certain complications uh, in, in other areas. You mentioned kidney, you mentioned cardiovascular complications as well. Which leads me to my next set of questions to Dr. Steve Bartlett. Dr. Bartlett, we're living longer. Clearly, and in fact, many of, many of these uh, we can attribute or ex extended life expectancy to certain life-extending work and innovations by physicians. But at the same time, we're learning uh, about organ failure increasing. Are, you, are we going to blame the fact that we're living longer while our, while our, our organs are wearing out? Uh, sh should we not be uh, pursuing that route? Well, this we is usually, slightly provocative, you, as you yeah, probably it, gather. It's a great question, Al, and I appreciate the chance to be here uh, with the rest of us, but I think, uh, as Steve well knows, we're very accustomed to simply just blaming the internists. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that's a patented joke. Uh, <laughs> Steve and I are uh, locked in arms. The reality is, is that the factors are a uh, number. Uh, genetic factors are probably the uh, greatest uh, set of factors that decide whether you're going to get end organ disease despite even well-managed diabetes. And there was a trial in 1993 of best practice of managing the blood glucose in a, about 1,500 individuals. Over a seven year uh, time, some received very tight controls, some received um, a much more modest and traditional or conventional control. At the end of that period, it was clear that those that received the tight control, those who could tolerate it because there was a lot of side effects, clearly were better off in terms of having less eye disease, less kidney disease and less neurologic disease and the peripheral neuropathy that diabetics are so prone to. But what wasn't studied in that study, in which I'm sure there's much more information that Steve could bring to bear, are the genetic factors that decide, the response genes that decide who is really going to have a rough go with diabetes and who is going to be a lucky diabetic. And all of you probably know one of each, where someone by age 30 is just a wreck and somebody who's 75, and how in the world they got to even take care of himself, and he makes it all the way with very little disease. So I don't think we're living too long. I think it's probably going to be much more genetic factors and care, ambulatory care models to deliver a broad base of care to the diabetic patients that are out there. I think that's probably what's most in my mind about that. Well, Dr. Bart, let's open it up to just uh, uh, organ failure in general, not necessarily diabetes related. And Clearly, we, are, we, we, we know this is an expertise of yours, and within your department, there is a very strong uh, expertise in, in organ transplantation of various types. Well, so the question, what are the risk factors, and, and, and how can folks in the, in, in the audience get a sense as to what, what are some of the factors that would, would place them at the greatest risk for organ failure, and how did they avail themselves of transplantation? Right. Well, let's uh, go through each of the organs, because they're all different. The most commonly transplanted organ is a kidney transplant. And when we transplant a kidney, um, those patients 
will have had a small number of diseases that might have caused it. Number one, diabetes. Number two, hypertension. Number three, a genetic disorder, adult polycystic kidney disease. And uh, number f that's number four, APKD. And number three, which I skipped, is the bunch of diseases all known as glomerulonephritis. And when you really just take all those, you've covered about 90% of them. And all of them are either genetic or acquired, but they're certainly not anybody's fault. But there's a lot that can be done to forestall kidney disease. And even when you know you have a disorder that might lead to eventual kidney disease, and the single most important way to forestall it is blood pressure management. And uh, that will uh, do a lot. But we can't prevent renal failure in everybody. And in some people, they ultimately need to come to either dialysis or kidney transplantation. And when presenting the differences between dialysis and transplantation, it boils down to that dialysis is relatively safe from treatment to treatment, whereas transplant has some front-end loaded risks. But then once you get past this front-end loaded risk, the quality of life with a transplant is dramatically better than it is on the day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day dialysis because of the requirement to go to a dialysis unit and all of those inconveniences. And the vast majority of patients, provided they have a sufficient health basis to tolerate having that uh, front-end loaded uh, risk of surgery, and that's really most of candidates, will choose to have a transplant. Having chosen a transplant, they can get an organ from one of two ways. One, from a living donor, a friend or a relative, and sometimes even an anonymous donor, or from a deceased donor, someone who's been in a car accident or had a heart attack or stroke, ultimately becomes a deceased donor, uh, either through brain death or a cardiovascular death. One of the innovations that we've uh, developed at the University of Maryland in the last uh, two to three years is an innovation of being able to remove a kidney from a living donor through an incision that's no more than about two inches big. And I don't know if that slide is queued up now or not. I don't, that's, uh, well, we're kind of talking about lung first. Um, let me uh, double forward, there it is. You can see in the far left panel, you can see someone's umbilicus, where a two inch incision was made to remove a kidney. It snaps shut, we sew the skin shut, and that'll heal in about two days. And on the other side is the actual kidney transplant. That's my hand holding the kidney being uh, transplanted. So that's a real innovation, and it's help, helping us to identify a living donor. Going backward, that is a young man who came in to the uh, medical center in almost complete pulmonary failure. He was looking at a very short lifespan because of his ability to oxygenate his blood was virtually gone. He was extremely ill and uncomfortable. And we put him on a device that Bart Griffith developed in the laboratory. He put him on a portable extracorporeal membrane oxygenator known as ECMO. Now, 10 years ago, if I put a patient on ECMO, it would be something about the size of a golf cart. Now, it can be worn on a belt, and the patient can walk around the ICU. And you can see how comfortable he is because of this min miniaturized ECMO device. And if you look carefully at the tubing going into his neck, the blood coming out of his neck, very dark purple because it's not oxygenating, and the blood going back in his neck is bright red. He doesn't even have to breathe as he sits in that chair. It's remarkable. He was very fortunate because he got a lung transplant the next day. He's now at home, back to his home, uh, going through the re rehabilitation. And as I understand it from another person uh, today, that he will be going back to work uh, this week. So all of that over about a three-week period, from uh, desk door to going back to work in three weeks. Well, Dr. Bartlett, that's, a, that's very exciting, obviously. Exciting uh, that we are making such, such huge inroads in transplantation. You mentioned kidney, and you mentioned lung. Yes. Uh, in the interest of time, there must be something new on the horizon. I mean, there, there, there are several more organs and, uh, or possibilities. Anything new on the horizon that, that, that we're doing at Maryland that you believe uh, could, could be a leading edge or is a leading edge in, in itself? Well, it, it's certainly new to uh, most of the people in the room here, not new to me. We've been working on this uh, for 12 years, and that's the idea of doing face transplants. The idea originally uh, was 
devised when we saw a request for application from the Navy for advanced warfighter protection strategies. The uh, discussion then ensued between myself and the Chief of Transplant at the NIH Navy program in Bethesda, and we thought, what are some of the things that we could do uh, that would be very novel and could get funded by the Department of Defense? And after seeing all the, uh, the IED injuries in Iraq, you know, we felt a lot of compassion for the soldiers whose faces were being badly deformed by the IEDs. We wanted to put together a face transplant program. We then engaged in a uh, research program based upon the model you see there, a lower hemiface model in the primate. And we made haste slowly at, very fir at the very first. But ultimately, I added two people to the program who really were fantastic colleagues for me to accelerate the program forward, namely, they were Rolf Barth, who had trained at Duke, but had had some time at the Massachusetts General Hospital with a leading immunologist, David Sachs, and then transplant training at Wisconsin. And he came to us to work with me on the basic science project. And we added Eduardo Rodriguez from the Shock Trauma Center, who had been recruited by Tom Scalia. We also put him on the animal project to further refine it. And once we saw that these uh, uh, transplants were lasting 450 to 500 days with very little immune suppression. We proceeded with our clinical trial. The young man you see there is the result of our first application of the clinical trial. And you can see from having a normal face as a young man to the devastated face to the early six day post transplant to where he is uh, right now. He is back integrated in society. This face not only looks reasonable, but he can emote with the face. He can move it, purse his lips, and express all of his thoughts through uh, his face non-verbally, which is an extremely important part of integrating into society. So he's doing well, goes to Orioles games and uh, uh, Ravens games, and whatever he wants to do now, he's back to work. So he has gone from living as a recluse behind a mask to really back to work and functioning normally in society. So, so that's part of my last question to you, and this is it. You've, you've obviously convinced me and hopefully others that uh, you have a, a real, real premier transplant center that transplants virtually all solid organs and now a composite tissue. Now, what, what makes your program and Maryland so special? It is clearly a destination site for anyone who has organ transplantation needs. So special. Well, what we, are the keys? We brought together, uh, under the School of Medicine, which has so many rich resources, a number of scientists who are all dedicated to this project. And so it's a very multidisciplinary program. We have uh, immunologists, we have geneticists, physical therapists, psychiatrists, uh, a strong nursing program. And then, of course, the entire shock trauma center and the, all the resources that they can bring to bear on this. But the melding of the scientific program with the clinical program allows us to develop the new ideas and do the next thing. The last thing we intend to do is apply this to all organ transplants. A vascularized bone marrow, we believe, has the potential to make a standard kidney transplant tolerant, meaning you won't have to take immune suppression won't have to have the side effects, and we'll never reject that organ. That's where we're going next. Can you show the very last slide? Or I guess I can do that. Uh, yeah, so that very last slide. And I just wanted to point out that, you know, Archimedes, uh, he's, everybody thought he was very into uh, mathematics and mechanics, but in fact, he was an expert in philanthropy. And I think he was talking about philanthropy when he said, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum to place it and I will move the world. And so I think he wasn't just talking about a lever, he was talking about leverage. <laughs> 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 Dr. Barnett, thank you very much. And uh, on that note, we'll transition to our next speaker. Thank you so very much. Dr. Cullen, unfortunately cancer is uh, our number two cause of death in America and is uh, We've, we've made some inroads, clearly, and people are living longer with cancer. It's, in some respects, there are, it could be considered a chronic disease in some, some aspects. What are some other risk factors that individuals should be mindful of with regard to cancer? And particularly, what, what research programs that are underway within your cancer program 
that you think is really truly making a difference in the life expectancy of those suffering with cancer. And I leave it to you open to carve out the cancers as you see appropriate. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for all, all of you being here. And I want to reiterate, Al, your thanks to Stuart and Lynn Weitzman for their wonderful support over the years. And we're also very fortunate to have Michael Greenbaum here, Michael's uh, parents, Marlene and Stuart's visionary um, support of the Cancer Center has really gotten us to where we are today. Um, when I talk to the medical students or the residents, I try and make the point that cancer is changing and evolving very, very rapidly. Um, there are about 1.6 million new cases of cancer in the United States every year, um, st still about 600,000 deaths. Um, it actually is the leading cause of death in adults in the United States, except for the very elderly. Once you get to be in your 80s and beyond, cardiac disease um, becomes more of a, a threat. But for, for the majority of people in this room, in, in the age, uh, age group in this room, cancer is the leading cause of death in the United States. But it's getting dramatically better. When I was a kid, um, shortly when I was a very small child, my grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer. At that time, uh, in the late 50s, if you were diagnosed with cancer, your chance of surviving in the United States was one out of three. Um, two out of three people died, one out of three survived. Um, when, I was, uh, when I entered medical school, it was about 50-50. Today, two out of three people diagnosed in the United States with cancer are cured of their cancer. Um, there are more cancer, there are, there are about three times as many cancer survivors in the United States today as there are people who live in the state of Maryland. So there are about almost 15 million cancer survivors. And that number is, is going, up, going up rapidly. Um, so the, the landscape is, is changing very, very rapidly and we're doing much better. Cancer mortality peaked in around 1990 and has been dropping fairly steadily since. It's, the cancer mortality is dropping about two and a half percent per year in the United States because of better treatments, better diagnosis, but be people taking care of their, themselves um, specifically around smoking. To, you asked what are the risk factors, what are things that, that people can do. I was at a function a, uh, a while ago and I happened to be introduced to the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Mr. Vilsack, and, and he asked a question that a lot of people ask me when they're first introduced and they learn what I do, will we ever have a cure for cancer? And I said, you know, in a perfect world, you as the Secretary of Agriculture, with a stroke of the pen, could eliminate more than almost two-thirds of the cancer in the United States with the stroke of a pen. And he looked at me like I was from Mars. And he said, I'm the Secretary of Agriculture. I said, if you could, by stroke of pen, say there would never be a, a tobacco product sold in the United States again, about a quarter of cancers would, would go away. If you said every time someone walked into a McDonald's and they offered a double Big Mac, um, the, the, the cashier said, could you step on the scale, please? <laughs> and, and if your body mass index was above 25, they'd say, sorry, no Big Mac for you today. Come back, come back tomorrow. And, and I said, you know, there are the, those issues of courts and things like that. I, I realize it's a little more complicated. But the point is, most cancers are preventable. If we eliminated smoking, if people kept their body mass index, obesity and inactivity probably cause another 25% of the cancers. Obesity is associated with a dramatic increase in the risk of colon cancer, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, prostate cancers. All of those would fall dramatically if people exercised. And, and, the, and to, to Steve's point earlier, um, the, the benefit in, in diabetes would be dramatic. We're also appreciating that lots of, uh, or an increasing number of cancers are due to preventable infections. Viruses cause cancer. Um, the viruses include papillomavirus, which causes cervical cancer, um, many head and neck cancers, other uh, uh, genital uh, cancers. Um, hepatitis virus causes an enormous amount of uh, morbidity and mortality from liver cancer. Um, HIV AIDS, um, people, when I was in medical school and a resident, people who had HIV or AIDS um, died of infections within a few months. Now they live decades and they die of cancer. Um, so many of these uh, viruses we have vaccines for, other of the viral infections are preventable. So really applying what we know now, we can dramatically reduce the uh, impact of cancer in the United States. And, and one of the failures that we as a profession and I think the public as a whole face is that we focus 
appropriately on many levels, on the research up for new treatments and new diagnoses when we don't put enough effort as a, as a nation, as a society, into putting in place what we know because that would have a very dramatic impact today or tomorrow. A um, couple of examples of, of, uh, of research that I think have taken place at Maryland that are very important and have had a big, big impact. Um, a number of you have heard me talk about the, the groundbreaking work of Dr. Angela Brody. Dr. Brody is a, uh, has been a longstanding member of the faculty and a number of years ago she invented a class of drugs called aromatase inhibitors. Aromatase inhibitors have been the single most important advance in the treatment of breast cancer in the world in the last 25 years. I'll say that again, the single most important advance in the treatment of breast cancer in the last 25 years invented at the University of Maryland. When her drugs were introduced a few years ago, they were first shown to reduce a woman who had breast cancer, reduce her risk of getting, uh, having a recurrence by 40% or more. Um, two years ago, a study showed that if women who were at high risk of developing breast cancer but didn't even have it, you could cut that risk by 65%, better than any of the interventions that Dr. Davis had talked about in preventing diabetes. So we can prevent breast cancer in 65% of women who are at risk. And then this past year, in collaboration with Dr. John Olson, a surgical oncologist that Steve recruited from Duke, um, her drugs were shown to, uh, for women who had locally advanced breast cancer and who would have required a mastectomy or complete removal of the breast, um, treatment with these drugs can reduce the, uh, the, the need for a mastectomy by more than 50%. So that's one example of, of research at Maryland that we're very excited and very proud of and that has had a huge impact not just uh, locally but uh, around the world. Thank you. Dr. Kutka, let me follow up on that and say, for example, we talked about the fact that the cancer center that you direct is clearly very, very, very unique, very distinguished. There's no reason why, one, it has gotten the National Cancer Institute's designation, one of the 66 in the country. The U.S. and the world report ranks it so high. What makes it so special? Why is it rising so rapidly? What are the, some of the things that, that, we, that you'd like to share with us? Sure. Well, I think th there, th there are two aspects, to, two answers to that. One is the, the excellent research, which is, the, the, is really a main focus for the NCI, and, and the work of Dr. Brody, which I mentioned, is, is a, a leading example of that. In terms of clinical care, um, we have really worked hard to recruit excellent faculty and build multidisciplinary teams, and that's critical. Uh, and the important thing to remember, if, if you or a loved one gets cancer, simple rules. Your mouse is your worst enemy. Your phone is your best friend. People make the mistake all the time of going online and just trying to figure this out and click their way out of cancer. You can't do it. What we provide in, an, in a multidisciplinary setting is a team of experts who can look at you, look at a loved one, and say, we understand your problem. We know the, the multifaceted way of treating it. And we can come up with a unified treatment uh, recommendation. Studies have shown that if you're treated in an NCI designated center like Maryland, you're 25 to 30% more likely to survive if you have common cancers like breast and colon cancer than if you're tr treated in a community hospital. And that's because of the multidisciplinary teams of experts that we bring to bear. So an important thing to take away from this, if you or a loved one has cancer, you don't necessarily have to travel to Baltimore to get all your treatment. We would love to see you and love to see you, but it, it's, tremendously worth it to at least make that trip initially so that you, you have a, an appropriate treatment plan that a really good team of experts is, is, uh, is focused on giving you the best answer and the best, best treatment. And there's clear data now that shows that the outcomes are better if you do that. And I think I, I take it that uh, you'd want to say that, virtual, that, that all cancers are handled within the cancer center uh, scopes, all major cancers. So if someone had a relative, a loved one who they needed information on and they had to make that call, not go to the mouse, but by the phone. Right, pick up, pick up the phone and, you know, st I get two or three calls referred by Stuart and, or Michael, uh, you know, on, 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 and, we, and we, we love to get those. So p very, very seriously, if you, ever, if you ever have, God forbid, this kind of an issue, but you, you all likely will, either in your own lives or with someone you know or love, um, pick up the phone and we can help guide you and that's part of what we do and we, we, it's, it's, it's part of our responsibility and I think we're good at it. Thank you very much, Dr. Cullen. I'm gonna, we're going to segue to our last uh, speaker and then we'll open it up for, for, for a question and answer. Dr. Park, Dr. Davis sort of first set things up for you and that is diabetes. Uh, clearly uh, yes. one of the complications is, uh, of, of long-standing diabetes is really cardiovascular complications. There are other 
other complications related to other causes related to diabetes uh, complications as well. So let me ask you, uh, what are, when it comes to heart disease, recognizing risk factors, everyone would agree is key to optimizing outcomes. Yes. Key to optimize, if we can identify those risk factors, either try to mitigate or, or at least r eliminate them if possible. What would you say are some of the, these risk factors they should look for? And, I, and my follow-up question while I'm at it, and that is, many women I, either may or may not be aware of the fact that, that you think of breast cancer as mm -hmm. the major cause of death and not in fact realize that in women, cardiovascular disease can in fact, particularly young women, become the major cause of death. Would you comment on some of the things that, that you're doing in your team that could help identify those risk factors that at the same time try to mitigate or reduce the likelihood of complications that women, that everyone in general, but women in particular, might, might succumb to if they were not uh, well informed? Thank you, Dr. Reese. Um, I too like to sincerely thank uh, uh, being part of this distinguished panel. It is a privilege and an honor uh, to be here in addressing uh, these very um, critical issues. Um, as I was sitting here, it occurred to me that we are operating in a, in a society where we are battling uh, the same enemy, trying to attack it from different angles. Um, a lot of the same risk factors that you had mentioned and Dr. Davis had mentioned are the same things that we mentioned that, that um, in essence really affect the, the system, the, the person as a whole. And, and stepping back, I mean, just looking at the numbers that affect the cardiovascular realm, um, we know that the latest statistics showing 80 million people having cardiovascular disease of some type, whether it be affecting the muscles or the valves or the coronary artery structure of some type. Um, and we know that this definitely um, has bearing on the time and the aging because majority of those 80 million people uh, um, uh, 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 are those who are greater than 60 years of age. Not surprisingly, this translates into a heavy uh, mortality. Um, it is estimated that about 2,000 people die each day in the U.S. due to cardiovascular disease, and that's about one in every 39 seconds. And again, translating that into an economic burden, um, it's about $300 billion that we spend uh, direct or indirect costs that's related to heart disease and it's about 15 to 20 percent of the total health care cost. So if you kind of put the whole spectrum of what we're dealing with, you know, in, in, in that kind of capacity, it is a staggering uh, degree of, of, of disease that, that we're faced with. Now, we do have that, but the good news is we have made amazing strides in our ability to recognize and, and make interventions. Now, we have interventions on two different scopes, which we do at the University of Maryland. Um, and to adjust your first comment, Dr. Uh, Dr. Reese, about risk factors, the risk factors that we deal with every day are the ones you've already heard about. Um, smoking, probably smoking is still the ones that, that we really can intervene, and those are the ones that really do have a huge impact on the development of, on the acceleration of, and, and ultimately the consequence of, of your heart. So I think these are the, these are the factors that we're learning. Um, there was a recent a land-breaking sort of a, a clinical trial or a study that was just published um, last year that for the first time really looked at these risk factors and said, you know, we have studied what the short-term effects of these risk factors are. What is a long-term lifespan effect of having high blood pressure, of having high cholesterol, of smoking and, and, and being a diabetic? And, and amazingly, and not surprisingly, um, very small percentage of U.S. population were considered to be low risk, i.e. having no, uh, no risk factors, about less than 5%. All the others, majority, uh, had at least one. About two-thirds have two, if not more, of the risk factors. And for those individuals, you can see the, the survival curves were just vastly different um, and, and, and showing again that despite all the interventions that we have, um, just addressing these very basic lifestyle changes is so important. And the other thing that study brought out is that these um, traditional risk factors really trump over the ethnic background or the age of the patient in that you can definitely uh, work at improving your chances of getting cardiovascular disease at any age, no matter, no matter what kind of background that you come from. 
So having said all that, I think one of the things that we try to address uh, with our patient population is that um, at least by age of 40, everybody should have a sense and, and good knowledge of what your risk factor is. Uh, you know, knowledge is power, knowledge is key. Um, discuss with your doctor specific points, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, uh, specific lipids. Um, how about my body mass index? Is it, is it appropriate? Is it, you know, should I work on this? Um, how much can I exercise? What should I do? And I think you really have to be your own, ad, own advocate, your proponent in asking these very diligent questions to your, to your physicians. And, and the second thing that, that we do, and you mentioned about women, um, of course, American Heart Association has done a wonderful job in uh, making, raising the awareness of, of heart disease in women. I think women um, are still surprised, and I see this all the time in our cardiac care unit, when they're told that they have a, they have a heart attack. My goodness, you know, uh, I thought, you know, my, my uncle had it, my father had it, I never thought I would get it. And one, you know, we do uh, understand that due to hormonal uh, uh, changes uh, that women go through, they are more vulnerable at a certain lifespan, such as when they are about going through perimenopause stage and, and postmenopause stage, where there is uh, differences elicited in the, uh, in the lipid uh, makeup uh, due to, uh, during the menopause, for instance, uh, once HDL, the good cholesterol goes down and the LDL, the bad cholesterol, tend to go up. Um, high blood pressure also can set in at this time point, and also uh, glucose handling changes and then weight. Uh, women postmenopausal has a greater tendency to gain weight. But not only that, um, what is also becoming obvious is that for women, these same risk factors that affect, affect both men and women alike tend to affect women in a more, uh, more um, uh, uh, diverse and more um, structurally uh, adverse a way than it does men. So for the same age group, for the same degree of, say, HDL, LDL, it affects women more adversely than it does men. So for women o over the age of, say, 65, they really, really have to be diligent and, and very mindful of what the risk factor is and how they can improve that and to modify uh, whatever factors that they, that, you know, they can do. Um, at the University of Maryland, we, um, one of the ways that we are doing um, and, and uh, approaching patients at both spectrum of the cardiovascular disease is um, um, uh, seeing the person as a whole. And I think one of the things that we do excel at is uh, when patients present, no matter what degree or structure of the cardiovascular disease they may have, is really address the fact that, okay, what kind of symptoms do you have? What is troubling you the most? And try to hone down uh, uh, what the diagnosis is but also be mindful of that, you know, we, we, we live in a system of our body and you cannot really concentrate on one disease or one organ. Um, I have many patients that come to me and, and my colleagues where they've seen three, four, five other physicians who's been told, you know, I know you're short of breath, but your heart is fine, so it's not that. They'll see a pulmonologist and they'll say, no, it's, it's not the lung, it's, not the, heart, it's the heart. So it, it's just kind of uh, shoveling back and forth when the simple truth is, it's really not one or the other, it is the both. And, and you really have to look at the whole system in that approach. So we try to um, educate the patients uh, to try to let them know what their risk is, what they need to start by, uh, uh, and where they should start, in what capacity, recognizing that uh, you have to stay within the, the realm that they're able to uh, operate in, and, and really let them know that um, there are many different ways of intervening medically, device-wise, surgically, but you cannot uh, uh, undermine or underscore the importance of really a good living and, and exercising every day. Thank you, Dr. Park. So clearly, Dr. Park has been emphasizing very much the important role of lifestyle. In fact, everybody has, yes. for that matter. Everybody has emphasized the important role of, uh, of lifestyle. And in fact, Dr. <coughs> Cullen has made it very clear that, that many of the cancers are ba basically uh, self-induced, lifestyle-induced, and the converse is true, that to the extent that we can actually alter our lifestyle, we can actually improve our health and reduce the complications, either the chance of developing diabetes or the need for certain organ transplantation or clearly the impact on cancer and most recently the impact on, on heart disease. So clearly we have a significant role that we can play as individuals in, in our own disease progression or disease initiation but most importantly, in our health maintenance. What I'm going to do at this point in the interest of time is stop and turn it over to you.
You ask questions now. Steve. You're, you're, by the way, you're killing the interest for dessert after this. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, have a, I have a number of questions, but I'll just ask one because I don't want to hog it, but then I'll, if I have time, I'll get back to everybody. But, uh, Dr. Davis, um, in discussing the type 2 diabetes, um, you know, I, I think everybody almost raised their hand that they know somebody. What are the general symptoms uh, of type 2 diabetes, if you don't know that you have it or somebody you care about has it? Thanks, Steve. That's, that's a really, really good question. And that's why it's, it's such an insidious and pervasive problem. Um, increased fatigue. And so as we work hard, um, we get into our fifth, sixth, seventh decade, we're getting tired. But um, type 2 diabetes can present with overwhelming fatigue. It, it can be thirst. It can be uh, going to the, to the bathroom. Um, and if you ignore those, then you can actually have a rapid loss of weight, which shows that you're, you're, in, you're in real problem. Um, about one out of five people present with the complications of the disease. So either blindness, foot problem, um, foot ulcer, um, kidney, kidney damage. Uh, so that's another way that it can, uh, it can present. Um, maybe one sidestep that I, I know Dean Reese is interested in and also the, the system. And I want to talk a little bit about, about pharmacogenetics and personalized medicine. Because this is the way forward. I'm sure you, you've heard of this. Um, and the school and the system are investing very heavily uh, in that. And what we're, we're trying to do is, is, first of all, identify individual genes that put you at risk for breast cancer and, and other common forms of cancer. And to do that, we want to harness the University of Maryland medical system with all its hospitals, touching close to three million people. And our dream is that every single patient that comes into the system will give permission for their DNA to be captured, and we can analyze this. Second step is, okay, what drugs best affect that patient? So if you have a condition, we want to know whether drug A is better than drug B that will cure that whether drug A will cause less of a side effect compared to drug B. And is it safe? The third thing, and I hope Kevin will, will talk about this, is that not only are we thinking about the whole person in personalized medicine, but actually bits of the person, certainly cancer, can affect and have differential effects. Because in, in fact, within a certain cancer, there can be different genetic makeup that can be a, a target for treatment. And lastly, we're now thinking about bacteria within the gut. And uh, we have an institute for genome science led by Claire Fraser, um, who understands that bacterial genomics can affect whole body genomics, and also the environment, the so-called epigenetics, so that you can have a genetic makeup, something can happen, and which can affect affect how a drug can affect you or a disease. And Steve, we are really interested in applying that to, to diabetes, both its treatments and its complications. There's something that, that Steve Bartlett was talking about, trying to identify people who are at risk of getting the horrible complications of, of diabetes up, up front. And that which, uh, Dr. I'm going to get you, John, that which <coughs> that Dr. Davis uh, said, uh, Steve, regarding what he would like to do is not science fiction. In fact, we've already initiated some of those uh, efforts already, not just in studying, but in treating patients in that individualized manner. So it's something that is it's really on the horizon, but actually elements of it have already begun. John? Yeah, um, the individual that Steve Bartlett showed on, on his slide is from the Eastern Shore, and he's a friend of many of us here in the room. And he and many other people from the Eastern Shore had the good fortune of finding their way to Steve Bartlett and his team at the University of Maryland. And I'm not telling the people in this room anything. These are a special group of people that have done wonderful work there. But Steve, the question for you is that 
you obviously in your team have developed a lot of different techniques and things that are used in transplant. How do you go about sharing that with other physicians and other transplant people around the country? Mm. And what's that effect been on, on your, at the, the University of Maryland and, and the number that we do and things of that nature? You know, the leading way we communicate what we're doing is through peer-reviewed publication. And uh, the technique uh, that BART has developed with this miniature uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenator, he will be publishing that uh, very, very soon as he gets enough patients entered in the trial. And it's not unusual also that surgeons who know about that will travel to spend a year with us for extra training. And we have a couple of cardiac surgery fellows now who are fully trained, but they don't feel they're ready for prime time because they want to get additional training with uh, you know, a master of cardiac surgery like Bart Griffith or a Jim Gammy. So that's two of the ways where we can really communicate what we're doing to the world. There's a hand over here. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Davis. Uh, Dr. Davis if an individual, I, I think they can hear me. Um, all right. Uh, if an individual should have no issues with genetics or cholesterol or obesity or blood pressure, but has elevated blood sugar levels, uh, what is the risk there and what percentage of cases would have those ingredients? So to, um, okay, to partition um, your question, if you have raised blood glucose longer than five years and everything else is fine, then you're at risk for eye disease, going blind, kidney disease, and nerve, nerve damage. Those tend to be very glucose specific. Then you start adding on the high blood pressure and the cholesterol, that's when you, you start getting um, strokes and, and heart attacks. But Kevin's point about obesity and, uh, and cancer is, is really highly relevant. And as we go forward, I think you're going to find that obesity is going to become the major cause of cancer in, in the Western world. There was a, yes, sir. Right, right. Just and, wondering. And, and you'll be next over here. With uh, you being able to get home blood pressure monitors that are easy to use, now you can do a pulse oximetry at home. Mm -hmm. Just wonder what you would recommend any of us have in our homes and how often we should be checking certain signs. Um, Let me uh, have, have Dr. Park answer that. Cardiologist can answer Thank that. You. Yeah. That is an excellent point. Um, and we, as part of our teaching tool, uh, we go through what can be done home on a regular basis to keep track of your. Uh, risk factors and for instance blood pressure that's an excellent point and I often ask people to bring their if they have a blood pressure uh, meter, meter to bring it with them to one of their clinic sessions so that we can make sure that it correlates uh, to our reading um, uh, the oxygen saturation you mentioned a lot of my patients I, I take care of are on oxygen and it has to be titrated to the most optimal degree and also that's not only at rest but also with activity and exercise so in that regard, having a SAT meter is really, really helpful. The other thing is blood glucose. For people who are diabetic, um, as we've all, all stressed, keeping your blood glu glucose range at an optimal level is also very, very crucial. And of course, daily weights is another component. As we we're discussing, obesity and weight gain that happens so insidiously is really the basis of evil that can, that can uh, uh, cause all of the things that we we're discussing. So, so I think all of these measures definitely can be, and for some of my patients, I've asked them to do this specifically, um, I kept a record of this um, on a notebook, and please bring, the, bring with them at the, uh, with their routine visits. If they, I also give them uh, certain uh, uh, guidelines, if they see blood pressure above, say, this range, or if their weight goes up by this much, to give us office a call so we can be preemptive in, in, you know, in targeting that and treating it. But I think for people that are otherwise healthy um, and, and but want to be more proactive in taking care of themselves, I think um, uh, reviewing all the risk factors for the physician and say, what would you recommend that I keep tabs on these at home? And I think for, for most people, I would say weight and blood pressure are definitely the key. Um, and probably having the lipids checked maybe two, three times a year um, to make sure that that is staying where they, they should be. And also, um, but again, the other thing is physical activity. Um, exercising at an amount that it, you're comfortable with, and it's recommended about 30 minutes of walking on most days of the week, 
probably has the best science behind the improvement that it has. So I think all of those things, uh, if you can structure that in your life, you're, you're probably doing you know, better than you could with any therapy or, or any kind of a treatment that we have. Sir? Hi, thank you. Thank you for this fantastic uh, um, overview. Uh, 37 years ago was my first introduction to the University of Maryland. Uh, my dad uh, got kidney cancer 37 years ago. And uh, he was obese, and he was a smoker. And fast forward uh, about 31 years ago, my brother, also a smoker and also obese, um, developed kidney cancer, was treated at the cancer center, and was completely cured, for which I am eternally grateful. And my good friend Stuart Weitzman was, as you said, pick up that phone, and I do greatly appreciate it. I'm wondering about the, the, the familiar part of it, but then I want to add one little unfortunate uh, add-on. My brother, the same brother, um, developed multiple myeloma, but he's been a very serious, he was a very serious smoker and very, very obese. And I'm wondering if you think it's A, familial, or B, more lifestyle. Dr. Cullen. Um. So in terms of uh, familial kidney cancer is described, it's quite rare. Um, most, it's, it's a very, very small set. And I think familial cancers have been described much more commonly in other scenarios. There, there are certain genes that um, are in certain po populations. So for example, in breast cancer, ovarian cancer, what's called BRCA syndrome um, is, is well described. Um, typically when you hear a history like, like you just described, what we do is we have a wonderful genetic counselor at the cancer center, and larger cancer centers do. And so if we have a history that you know, sounds more than coincidence, we'll have you meet with that genetic counselor, and they'll go through the family tree and, and you know, have you dig up, the, call your aunts and uncles, and go through things in enormous detail, and decide whether or not more advanced testing or more specific surveillance um, is necessary. Um, so there are some genes that we have been able to describe um, that we can identify and test for now and identify a person's risk based on their family history. In other circumstances, there may be a gene that we just haven't identified yet. And so the, if the family history is striking enough, we may recommend more stringent screening through ultrasound or, or something else. As far as myeloma is concerned in, in your brother's situation, that hasn't typically, be, that, there isn't a smoking association there. So if I had to suggest, I would say it was most, that's probably the, the, the single biggest risk factor. Myeloma has not typically been described to have a, f a familial or predisposition or a predisposition, predisposition with obesity. Dr. Uh, Stuart Weitzman, the front here, and then I'm gonna go to you, sir, next. Uh, Dr. Collins. You, 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 want, you, want, <laughs> sure. you want to walk them so, through, Kevin? So, um, thanks, Stuart. Uh, <laughs> so, treating cancer, as I a little bit um, say in slightly a flip way, is really kind of a team sport these days. The, in the past, if you had cancer, you saw a, a single specialist, usually a surgeon, and if you were fortunate enough, your, your tumor could be removed and you, um, you went on. Now we, f we frequently treat cancers with a combination of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery simultaneously in an effort to, to, to cure the patient. So what we do at Maryland, and we were, we were a, really one of the first major centers to do this, when, we s when a, someone comes in um, or calls, we will have them come in and they'll be seen in a single visit, usually by uh, a medical oncologist like myself who, who treats with drugs. Um, a radiation oncologist who uses uh, advanced radiotherapy techniques, and a surgeon. And those people will together look at the individual and, and their diagnostic studies and, and come up with a treatment plan. And so, for example, in what I do, which is head and neck cancer, very, a very 
common treatment these days um, would be we would start with a combination of chemotherapy and radiation and then follow that up with surgery. Whereas in the old days, if we did it in, in reverse order, surgery was, would be done at first and it was a much larger, much more morbid, much more debilitating surgery. So that kind of multidisciplinary approach, which includes teams of physicians, but it also includes dietitians, it includes social workers, it includes n nurses. We really wrap a, an, an entire care team around the patient to, to come up with um, the optimal care plan, and we do it very efficiently. And that's why I make the point again that if you or a loved one is diagnosed with cancer, pick up the phone because the, the thing that you can do to help yourself the most if you are facing a cancer diagnosis is get yourself into a team like that um, as opposed to going to one specialist at a time and trying to put all that together yourself when you're stressed, when you're sick, when you're afraid and, and you can't process the information. We, try, we have built the systems to do that and I think we do it very well. Dr. Park has, a, has a, an analogous uh, team yes. approach to, to cure as well. If, if, I, if I may jump on that bandwagon as well. Um, from a cardiac standpoint, we, we uh, really do um, take care of our patients much of the same manner. Uh, one of the, uh, the latest, more, most premier programs that we do have is handling people with aortic valve diseases, whether they uh, should, which, how they should best be treated, whether it be traditionally um, surgical or whether it be transcutaneous uh, valvular approach. So we have a clinic where they are seen by the surgeon, the cardiologist, and also the, uh, the social worker and other team members that can fully assess them, look at the images, and really determine the best approach. And I think that is definitely the way um, as far as best care for the patient and its efficiency. And I guess also from our standpoint, just better uh, uh, information uh, dissemination because you can talk to your colleagues and see what they're thinking and, and, and just kind of discuss with the patient there, you know, what the best, you know, approach would be. So I think that's definitely something that we're, we're doing as well. Um, the, the other aspect I want to mention is um, Maryland, uh, University of Maryland uh, Heart Center. We are the, uh, the leading uh, transplant center in the state of Maryland. Uh, we also do the most number of devices, the assist devices or the artificial hearts, which we have uh, many different uh, kinds of. And of course, uh, under Dr. Bartlett's leadership and Dr. Griffith, we have uh, done the initial implantation, uh, uh, clinical trials, and on several of those uh, assist devices. Um, the other thing that we are uh, recognized for is the pulmonary hypertension center, as, as was mentioned. And, and because of uh, the pulmonary hypertension is, is housed in cardiology, um, and, and most institution is in, is in pulmonary, I think we have a unique capacity to really take care of the patients that, like I said, that have a, a both heart and lung disease in a very comprehensive, unified manner. And, and I think, again, this takes a very dedicated team, not only as physicians, and we are just a small part of it, but the nurse practitioners and, and the inpatient nurses, the pharmacists and the dietitians and nutritionists all really come together to help the patient really get their life back. And so this is what you know, we try to do and, and you know, get a very systematic approach, but also with the care and understanding that you know, everybody comes from a different way, different view, and, and you gotta take care, you gotta take you know, their background into consideration. But I think, you know, I know that's the buzzword, multidisciplinary, but it really is a, a, a very, very um, a necessary, I think, especially in this day and age, to take care of the complex uh, uh, you know, patient problems that we all deal with. Sir, right here. maybe a cardiologist or urologist or whomever, and we get conflicting uh, reports. Blood tests come in one time, three months later, you know, you have totally different uh, uh, blood work, and uh, one, week, one time your glucose is high, the next time it's normal, and the next person is taking some additional diabetic test to make sure that you are not diabetic and it's just a, a fluke type of a situation. So, Basically, what it comes down to is, like you said, you know, the mouse is your quarterback. <laughs> and that's scary. Uh, the question is, uh, at the University of Maryland Health Systems, uh, do you have an executive type of a program, which could be the quarterback, instead of using a mouse? Uh, I wanna... and, uh, and each department has its own uh, primary uh, concerns, but when you go for like an executive physical, do all the departments and all the people, you know, work together to try to quarterback your particular situation so you're not jumping through 
multiple tests through multiple doctors with multiple treatments, none of which is necessary, or maybe just a few are necessary? That's my question. L let, me, uh, uh, let me try to respond to your question uh, as a start. First of all, I, I can understand if you are going to multiple doctors and getting different comments, responses, uh, results, it will be confusing. At the University of Maryland, we do have an executive program. And it could, we could, it could, it's configured around, it's individualized. So yes, there is an executive program where, where for example, Dr. Cullen used the term, not the mouse, but, but the phone. We, we have a, a special program called a concierge program. So with one call to that concierge desk, you could be, you could be uh, channeled to an executive program. During that executive program, you'd have typical comprehensive examination as is, as is appropriate. Or if that is not what, what is necessary, a less comprehensive examination and be channeled to a specialist as is appropriate. So again, it's individualized. Many people will come in for an executive physical and that's the end of it. Others may come in for some of that and need to have subsequent follow-up with, with the cardiologist or a nephrologist, as the case might be. So yes, there is a program. Another, another point I'd like to share with you, and that is we do, the, we do consultations as, as well. So should there be a need for clarification or, 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 or review or, or some kind of input on some of the information that you have? If that happens to be within the area of, uh, of a cancer program or a diabetes program or a surgical program, I can certainly say with, with complete comfort that each of these individuals would be happy to respond. One way of, one way of making it a one-stop shop, for example, if you wanted, is again our concierge program could be an, an entryway. But if you have specific needs, specific questions in specific areas, you certainly could, could call Department of Medicine, Dr. Davis is the chairman of the department, and he could triage that call for you. Or if that happens to be a surgical problem, so I think you should you take advantage of those of these individuals. Or certainly, Dr. Cullen would would be happy to respond in the can for the cancer center and make the appropriate uh, triaging. So, direct answer: Yes, we have what you asked for. Another yes, hey, Robert. It's a really good question, as, and, and as I said before, one of the things that we never really grappled with is that there are 15 million cancer survivors in the United States, and most people who are treated for cancer will survive and, and will, will look at a normal lifespan after cancer. Um, we ha are developing now, but it's, it's still in, in the relatively early phase, in an effort to address that, a survivorship program, which includes um, after-treatment care plans. So frequently, I mentioned multidisciplinary care, but f one com common complaint that we get is, well, my treatment's done. I had four or five doctors who were treating me. Now who's in charge and what do I do and what's my follow-up and what's my schedule? So we now for, for the, have worked out, um, and you, when you get an educational program when you come in and when your treatment is finished, you get an educational program that says, this is what your treatment was. Um, this is the, these are the intermediate and long-term side effects you can expect. Um, this is who's responsible for following you and, and ma maintaining surveillance afterwards. And these are the things that you should be A, looking out for, but B, sh should be doing to recover faster in terms of nutrition and exercise and, and, the, and the rest. So it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an excellent point and it's exercise and physical therapy is a, is a component of the survivorship program that we're doing, which includes lots of other things like psychosocial support, um, 
scheduling uh, appropriate monitoring and follow-up visits and answering the, the other question, you know, who's, who's really the quarterback once your treatment is done because it may be very different than, than when, when you're undergoing treatment. Yes, a question there? Yes, this is for Dr. Cullen. I was fascinated by your discussion about the developments in breast cancer. And I'm wondering, is there anything on the horizon for either the in research or treatment of ovarian cancer? Mm. Um, very good question. Um, ovarian cancer has been much, has, has changed less than breast cancer, both in terms of our ability to diagnose it early um, and, and to treat it. There, are, there have been improvements in, um, in outcomes as a result of in, incremental improvements in, um, in chemotherapy and, 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 uh, and other treatments. But I have to say they're, they've been less dramatic, both in terms of our ability to screen and diagnose it mm -hmm. um, and uh, to treat it. Uh, the exception is there is a subset of women who are at risk for ovarian cancer who, as I mentioned before, are part of the, um, these hereditary syndromes. So I think one of the things that we understand much better now than we did 10 years or so ago is if you are Jewish, if you are especially Ashkenazi Jewish, which is the majority of, of um, ancestry in, uh, for Jews in the United States, um, and if there is a family history of breast or ovarian cancer, it's very important to think about um, uh, seeing a genetic counselor and determining whether genetic testing may be appropriate for you. Um, th unfortunately, the, the trials uh, of other screening for the population as a whole haven't been as positive as we had hoped they, they would have been. But, so I think probably the genetic testing for people in appropriate groups, especially anyone with a family history, um, is isn't an important understanding that's evolved in the last ten years. There are there are certainly drugs that are being tested, um, and there are new drugs in the, in the that are coming through the pipeline. But I think it's too early to say that there's been a breakthrough drug in ovarian cancer. The way aromatase inhibitors have really changed the face of uh, breast cancer. That's another mark. Can you speak a little louder, please? Well, I'm going to take that question, and basically, it's a very good question, actually. And, and Dr. Dr. Davis can just take a, a brief moment, and, and almost like a wrap-up, because I think that that really is re reflecting what's happened in the world in diabetes and in obesity. And I think each of you can just take a, a short, brief moment and just comment about how you see your particular area, in fact, is trending, and does that 10-year trend. I think it's an excellent question, Dr. Davis. I think the, the system grew out of one word, al alignment. And I think what you're going to hear over the next 10 years is another word called integration. And certain people have, have hit on, on this uh, this afternoon, whether you talk about multidisciplinary care, whether you talk about fragmented care. And I think what you will see over the next 10 years is first of all the university of Maryland Medical System coming together, integrated, coordinated, and communicating. You will have scientists within the School of Medicine and actually College Park and the other six schools around in UMB integrating together so that you can harness and amplify everyone's expertise in a patient-centered way. And I think the, the cures for these very complex chronic diseases, it, it's not one gene, it's not one person, it's going to be teams of individuals working together. So that actually is, is the vision for the university and, and the system. And I think if we come back in, in 10 years time, Mark, you're saying, okay, do you remember when we thought that, but then we did this, this, and this, and we will be applying genetic processes. We were thinking about stem cells, we'll be talking about immunology. We'll be talking about fancy new ways to monitor and, and cure diabetes and, and cancer. And I think that's what we will be talking about. 
I hope we get. Inv I want to be invited. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mark, uh, if, if, if we're here in ten years' time, uh, we, we're going to have him along. Do you think? Okay, we'll we'll have voted for you to be here. That's a Bartlett. So the biggest change in transplantation will be the aging of the donor pool. The deceased donor pool continues to get older. It was about 40, 20 years ago. Now it's over 60. Why? Because of the, the highway safety laws, the availability of CPR in the uh, automatic defibrillators in public. So we see the donor pool getting older and older. The next iteration will be gun control. And when gun control becomes, I'm not saying we need to get rid of guns. You just have to control the ones we've got. And uh, when that happens, the donor pool will be aging. So what we're going to see in the future is a very bifurcated set of donors. Donors that are very young, that come from living donors and are very healthy, and then donors that are much, much older. And scientists are going to have to figure out how to use both pools of donors. OK, Dr. Cullen. Um, I, think, I think the biggest changes that I expect and hope to see in cancer, Mark, would be much better um, and more effective implementation of prevention strategies. Uh, smoking and, and activity we've talked about. But vaccination is a peak. We're, we're learning that more and more cancers are really infectious diseases, and most of them can be prevented. Many of them we have vaccines for, and we're just not using them effectively. We're not vaccinating people for hepatitis. We're not vaccinating kids for papillomavirus. I treat two to three new patients with a papillomavirus-associated cancer, and the treatment is miserable, and it's completely preventable. We're vaccinating 2% of boys in the United States right now. Australia is vaccinating 80%. Um, we're doing a miserable job at preventing cancers with technology that we have in our hands today. Second thing that I think will be very different, and, and Steve talk, talked on this, is the whole field of genomic medicine. Um, not all cancers, and I don't even want to say the majority of cancers, are due to a, a single genetic abnormality, but some are. And when we identify those, increasingly we have a very specific treatment that attacks that target with a, with a drug. Most of the time those drugs are oral. They have a lot less side effects than the broader spectrum chemotherapies that we've used traditionally. So I think you will see increasing numbers of cancers that will be treated with very specific, much less toxic drugs over time. Dr. Park. Years. Um, what I'm hoping is that when we meet at the time, uh, we'll be able to say, you know, 10 years ago we were so concerned about the, the um, demographic, the st statistics we're seeing, namely um, the rise of obesity among young people, uh, the increase in cardiovascular death among those that are 35 or under. I'm hoping that through educational efforts and especially through government and, and policy efforts uh, that they're instituting, that this uh, increase will at least plateau and hopefully decrease. Because what we're seeing is um, really uh, more and more younger folks in our unit, which are severe cardiovascular diseases that really they should not um, have uh, been dealing with. Um, and I think this is a, a sort of a societal problem as a whole, but a, a huge one because it really um, uh, will uh, take a huge proportion of effort from our part to dealing with that and, and probably will outstrip some of the resources in, in some, some areas as well. The, the good part is um, in 10 years, I do think that we're gonna be seeing um, many ways to intervene in some of our more common cardiac functions without needing surgery, um, excuse me, Dr. Barlin, uh, that, uh, such as uh, being able to uh, fix uh, severe valve problems through percutaneous measures, for instance, or uh, uh, deal with more of a problematic uh, arrhythmia problems through percutaneous measures, which is already being done. And the other thing is the devices. Um, heart transplantation is a life-saving measure that we use in people with end-stage heart disease. But the number of transplants in this country as, as, as around the world has plateaued for a lot of the reasons that Dr. Barlett had covered. And what we have done in, in order to make up the difference of the need and, and of the availability of the donors is the assist devices of which we have uh, been discussing. Now we've gone through several generations of these machines and I think what we are uh, seeing is more um, uh, safe, smaller, uh, and better uh, machines that will be able to uh, handle not only the one side of the heart, the left, but hopefully the both sides, both sides of the heart, the left and the right, in, in, in a steady and reliable manner so that patients can resume their, uh, their, the uh, pace of their life that they're, they're hoping to. So hopefully in 10 years, we'll see some, hopefully not all of those uh, things available. You know, Mark, if I, if, if I may uh, just introduce uh, my own thoughts. 
ten, ten years from now. I think that uh, the, the comments that you heard from, from each really was a, a reflection of both optimism and trends. I also think that um, it's fair to say that some of the trends that are occurring right now, I expect to materialize in certain um, substantial, palpable uh, outcomes. Specifically, one of the things that, that we do at the University of Maryland is, is research that results in discovery and that which transforms medicine. Our tagline is, is where discovery transforms medicine. And many of the comments you heard earlier is, 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 is transformational comments. So I see research becoming even more enhanced, even more accelerated. In fact, we're in the process of launching a program called Acceleration in Innovation and Discovery. It's the next five year program. We're launching it as we speak. It's gonna be launched soon. So you're getting a preview. And that is simply to enhance the, this, the acceleration of discovery so that these, discovery, these discoveries can have direct impact on patient care. Many of, the, many of these discoveries that have occurred have taken 10 years. Dr. Bartlett's uh, face transplant took 10 years of discovery. We want to try to accelerate that to five years. That's what I expect to see within 10 years, and that is a hastening of that transition from the bench to the bedside to the community. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a uh, very exciting inter interchange. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope uh, we've been able to satisfy many of the, the questions or the, the, the thoughts that you had. And I would say feel free to, to contact any one of us. Uh, Jeff Rivers, the CEO of the, of the Medical Center. Bob Krenzig, the CEO of the, uh, the Medical System. Any one of us are available to you at any time. Uh, if you can't get us, you call Stuart Weitzman. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. and, 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 and Senator Frank Kelly right behind is will be the, the quarterback. Thank you very much. <laughs>